Composition can be taught in the same way that you can teach the essence of painting. I mean, no one ever really teaches you how to be inspired, but it's how you can turn your inspiration to the best into a real piece of music that people can play and listen to. As my composition teacher Elizabeth Lutchins famously said to me, not famously because I was the only person who heard it, um, I don't care whether you're inspired by a new girlfriend or a dented Coca-Cola tin, my job is to work out what that E flat's doing there. That balance equation between keeping your original vision, the sort of thing that keeps you awake at night, it's so exciting, going through all the craftsmanship and then coming back to achieve the result. We do regular workshops where we record and perform students' pieces and discuss them. They're learning it on the spot, just as a young playwright will learn more if they write a play, a scene, and actually start working on it with actors in a theatre. In certain instances, you have to change some things if you thought you had a cool idea. I tried to be very careful in how the chords are arrived at. In this particular passage here, uh, towards the end of the piece, the bass is singing just a downward scale, sort of very straight ahead. And, and in an ideal world, maybe I could have had them do something very dramatic and, you know, or, you know, something which might, to, to your ear, sound very dramatic and interesting. But because the texture is very dense, it, it's hard to have the basses be able to hear the notes they need to sing. And those are the kinds of things you have to be very sensitive about when you're writing for the voice. What you can't teach is inspiration and ideas. And that's often how it works. You, as days go past, you have all these little tiny ideas and you store them up on scraps of paper or just in your mind. And then when it comes to writing a piece, you think, well, what's, what's sort of in the, in the bits box? And then you fish something out and you think, actually, yeah, this, this is the place for this little bit. I like to think of um, my music perhaps almost on a time graph. I sort of start with almost a map of the whole piece of music. I really find that it helps to have an idea of what I'm trying to do on a larger scale. There's a joy, and I would use that word very advisedly, in working on paper. You can spread it out across the floor. You can invent different ways of sketching. If they physically feel it as they write, as Bach and Handel did copying out music, you cannot achieve the same result between eye, brain and ear uh, uh, with computer graphics. That's the process of music education, is teaching you what's come before and how you can use that. And then when you maybe one day become truly original is when somehow you include all those things but your own music transcends everything. But I don't think I'm at that point yet. I mean, I've made a career writing theme tunes for television. And so two of them, The Vicar of Dibley, and Mr. Bean. Uh, I used a cathedral choir, this one here at Christchurch. So I think that um, it's, it's a skill like anything else. You might come here and learn how to be an engineer, but I think if you came here and you learnt about choral music, uh, it would be a skill that was actually more applicable to modern life than you might think. Well, one of the most wonderful experiences you can have, I think, well certainly I can have, is watching young people grow. Having a BBC prom is one of the most exciting things that's ever happened to me. Uh, so, yes, it's an amazing feeling. Pressure, definitely, um, but even more nerve-wracking than being a composer is definitely being a performer. I enjoy, you know, that I've almost done my work and I can sit back and watch someone else do something brilliant with my materials.